Hello everyone, how are you? Good evening. Hello, sir. Hello. Please work to everyone. So we will start shortly about uh, maybe we can wait one more minute so we can start. So I think we can start. Um, so let's say, uh, I would say consider a language A, uh, which is one of our favorite language. Okay. Uh, we know from our understanding uh, about Turing machines and languages that A is decidable. Right. Right. Right or wrong? Yes. Yes, sir. So we all know that it is decided. So it is. It is perfectly known. Right. So if it is decidable, it means that there exists this Turing machine which decides a. Which in turn means that for any X, uh, that is a string of zero one, right? Uh, let's say we call the steering machine M, and M can answer the membership words. Right, so we know that what is the meaning of decidability? <clears throat> now we have a question, uh, and the question is: We know that it is decidable, and and we haven't dealt with this kind of questions before. And uh, and the question is that when we construct such a machine, suppose we create um, suppose we create this M is a single tape deterministic change. So the so the kind of questions that we need to ask is how much time does STM Needs to okay. This is the important question that we need to answer. We all know that this language A, um, I mean, we know that this language A is decidable. Whenever this n is greater than or equal to zero, this is decidable. But the question is that how much time does it does the PM need to decide the language? Okay. Okay. Is this question clear? That what we really want to do? Yes, sir. Okay. So, so right now, before uh, today. Uh, what we have been doing in this course is to see that whether so so first of all we try to figure out that what is computation and uh, what are the models of computation and then we talk about uh, what could be computed and what cannot be computed uh, so that, that is what is decidable what is not decidable and why something is decidable why something is not decidable, and things like that and whenever such, um, a discussion came in which we talked about uh, that a certain model uh, of computation takes more time to, to do something, and the other model is a bit more efficient. Uh, we tried to suppress this question in a sense, that in, in a way that that we we said that okay, we will talk about these topics at the end when we talk about uh, when we can clear the topic of computation. So we would talk about all those problems and all those aspects in in this topic. So now we don't question whether something is computable or not computable. 
we assume that something is computable. And if something is computable, then what is the time if, uh, that is required to compute a certain thing, right? So in, in such questions, if you look at here, that, so, so we are more interested in how much time does this CMM needs to decide, right? One may argue that maybe time is not the only thing that we, are, we should be interested. Uh, there are other measures which are more important. For example, uh, time is one of the resources, uh, but space is another resource which we may be interested in, right? So, so for example, um, we may be able to solve a problem uh, which is efficient um, in, in terms of time, but it requires a lot of space to solve, right? So that, that's maybe not practical in some ways. Uh, there's another important aspect and that aspect is, uh, I mean, that, that's more important in uh, current context. I mean, when we have distributed computers and we have uh, parallel computers and when computing is done for the internet, that is the communication cost. Okay, so we have time, we have a space, and then we have communication. So sometimes it is, uh, I mean, sometimes it is easy to do something on a single issue. Sometimes it is possible to break that problem into smaller problems and then allocate those problems to different computers which are distributed. Right? So they might be sitting uh, I mean, in, in the same room or they might be distributed across the globe. Uh, and, and those distributed computers can solve the problem very easily. Uh, but then the question comes that when this finished uh, the computation, how would they communicate come up with one solution, right? So that is called communication. So, so time is important, uh, space is important, and then uh, the third most important thing is communication. So there are other resources for which, may, which we may consider, but these three are typically uh, the main three resources that are considered in the complexity theory. Uh, so in this chapter, and in most of the most part of this uh, course, uh, we will be interested in uh, time complexity, I have included some topics for space complexity. If we have time, we will definitely cover. Uh, we will not go into much detail because uh, it is difficult uh, right now. Uh, and we may we, will, we may just touch upon uh, communication complexity if we have time and if there is some interest. <clears throat> All these three are important, but time is one of the most important thing and we will consider more. We will uh, spend most of our time on time. Is this thing clear? Yes. Okay. So let us consider a Turing machine M that decides A. So how would you construct that Turing machine? What do you think? How much, how, how would this Turing machine look? Let's call this M1. <clears throat> We would say that M1 is on the input. Uh, w. Okay. Uh, it has, it will do one thing, step number one, scan across. This is the first step. So you would scan the entire screen and you see that there is a zero which is uh, found after, at the right of one. It means that this string has to be rejected. It doesn't matter if the number of zeros are equal to one, right? It has to be rejected. So if it is not the case that all zeros are before all one, then we can go to the next step and see that if it has uh, the same number of zeros, right? So we say that repeat, so we need to repeat for steps. Uh, if both zeros and ones remain on A. So we need to repeat this process till both zeros and ones remain on A. 
if one of them finishes before the other, then they have to, right? So we say that scan across. So there's this indentation because it's inside the loop. Um, scan across. Okay. Crossing off. Single zero and a single end. if zeros still remain after all ones being crossed. or vice versa, reject, except otherwise, okay? So this is a very simple steering machine. The steering machine says that whenever this thing W is, is entered as the input to the machine, this machine will scan across the tape and see that if there is any zero, it is found to the right of one. And if it is the case, then reject it. If it is not the case, then we will check if the number of zeros is the same as the ones. And if it is the case, uh, then what you need to do, find for zero, and then find a corresponding one, cross them off. So you need to uh, do this to and fro motion on the clearing machine. Remember, we have a single tape, a deterministic clearing machine. Then you come back to the, to the zero, cross it off, uh, then find a corresponding one, and, and keep doing it. Um, and we need to repeat as long as both zeros and one remain on the tape. If one of them finishes before the other, if, if there are no zeros, but there are ones, or there are some uh, zeros and no, no one, then it means that there is, uh, there is a mismatch in the number of zeros and ones. Either there are more zeros than ones or, or more ones than zeros. In that case, uh, this thing is not uh, acceptable. Otherwise, if all the input symbols have been crossed off and there is no zero and no one, it means there was a corresponding one to every zero, and all the zeros are before all the ones, so that thing has to be accepted, right? So this is a steering machine M, and we understand that the steering machine M decides A. So the question is that how much steps this machine takes, right? So we need some definitions, and uh, we will talk about it. So let me write a definition for time I talked about time complexity, space complexity, and other things. So let, let, uh, let's start with the time complexity. We say that let M be a tuning machine. Okay. That holds on all inputs. If it holds on all input, it means that it is a decider, right? The running time. or time complexity of M is a function. What is this function? This is a function F, which is a function from set of natural numbers, set of natural numbers. F of N is the maximum number of steps that M uses on any input of length if f of n is the running time of n, say m runs in time f of n, and that m 
f of time, f of n time. So this is the definition of time complexity. Okay. So we say that if there is a trading machine M that decides some language. So this is exactly what we say that it holds on all inputs. So if it holds on all input, it means that it is a decider, it's not a decider. So we say that we, we have to figure out how much time this trading machine takes. So we say that there must exist. If there is a function like F, okay? And this function is from the set of natural numbers to set of natural numbers, uh, that means that uh, it, 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 it's not a real number function, it's, it's a function on a non-negative integer. So we have a function f, which is from set of natural numbers to set of natural numbers, uh, where we say that this value f of n, uh, this value f of n is the maximum number of steps that the machine m uses on any input of length n. For example, if we go back to our example here, uh, where we have this n1, then we definitely know that depending on the on the length of the input, the running time of the machine uh, will change, right? So for example, if I pass a string that contains just two characters, and then I pass a string that contains 100 characters, then we definitely we know that the definitely, uh, the time taken to come up with a conclusion or an answer uh, in case of 100 characters must be more than time taken by the machine when the input of the size, was of the size two, right? So, so the running time depends on the input as the size, the input size uh, grows, uh, the running time will also increase, right? So they, it, it will take more time to, uh, to solve the problem of bigger size, and it takes smaller time of, I mean, less time uh, to solve a problem of smaller, uh, smaller, right? So we say that that number of steps taken by a Turing machine is captured by the function f. So this function f is a function which actually counts the number of step, steps taken by the Turing machine. So we don't count the time in terms of seconds or milliseconds or microseconds or hours or days. No, we don't count it that. We count the time in terms of the steps. So it is very important and fundamental to mention here that, that the time complexity, whenever we talk about time complexity, be it, it's, be it is the time complexity of an algorithm, or a time complexity of a trading machine, we are not interested in the actual empirical time required by a certain specific physical machine. Rather than we are more interested in the number of steps taken by your solution. Now, why it is why it is important? It is important because um, because we know that let let's say we don't talk about trading machine. We talk about a program. Right? So it is possible that I write a program in a specific language on a specific machine using some specific operating system, right? So let's say you write a program in Java uh, that runs on some machine, some laptop. Now I can take the same program that is that you have written in Java and I can run the program on a much faster machine. Now, if, I, if I'm measuring the time in milliseconds or microseconds, then your measurement will differ from my measurement because I have a better machine, for example, or you might have a better machine. Or maybe after a few years, we all have uh, much better machines, then the, then the measurements that we have done before will no longer be uh, realistic, right? They will not be, I mean, applicable. So we want our measurements to be independent of the efficiency of a machine, and we want our measurements to be independent of any uh, lower level machine specific things, be that uh, the limitations for the programming language or operating system or hardware or any other uh, other mechanism which can impact the running time. So that's why we say we talk about the number of steps. So for example, if my algorithm, if my program written in any specific language takes, let's say 10 steps, then if I run the program on a slower machine, then it will still take 10 steps, right? So it doesn't matter how fast the machine is or how slow the machine is, it will still take the same number of steps to come up with a solution. Now, if you have a faster machine, it will take less time. If you have a slower machine, it will take more time, but the number of steps will remain the same. 
That's exactly what we do with Turing machine. We said that if we can come up with a function which actually counts the number of steps required to solve a problem, required to compute a problem, compute a solution to the problem, uh, then, then that will be independent of how we implement that Turing machine in reality, right? Or how we can translate that Turing machine into a computer program and we implement that computer program on, on any specific physical machine. So it is, it is important that we distinguish the time complexity from the actual uh, empirical physical time in the number of steps. Is this thing clear? Is this thing clear? Any questions? Okay, now all our attention is toward these functions, right? So we have these functions. And maybe there's a function f, maybe there's a function g, maybe there's a function h, and so on. Uh, so this f function could be uh, a function that measures the time complexity of machine M1. G could be a function that measures the time complexity of machine M2, and so on and so forth. Maybe all those machines are implementing the same problem, uh, or maybe they are different machines. But whenever we have such a concept, uh, we have to compare the running time. Right? We need to compare running times. Okay, so we need to figure out that if a machine takes this many steps to compute something, then when do we call such a machine more efficient than another similar machine? So what are the relationship between different uh, time complexity functions? So we would call these functions fg and h time complexity functions. So what are those? Uh, what are those functions? So for that we adopt a notation which we call Asymptotic notation. Okay. And specifically, we have asymptotic upper bounds, which we will consider. So when we talk about asymptotic upper bounds, I will talk about these independent of time complexity function, and then we will generalize or, or we would specialize rather uh, for time complexity, right? So let us start. So I say, let F and G be two functions. Such that both these f and g are functions from set of natural numbers, positive real numbers, or non-negative real numbers. So we say we say that f of n is in o, o of g of n. Okay, so I will write it here. Uh, that what, how do we read it? So we say that, so in blue, I would write f of n is in big O of g of n. Okay. When do we say that? If positive integers c and n zero exists. Such that for every integer n greater than equal to n sub zero, f of n is at most three times g of where so we say when 
f of n is in O of big O of G of n, we say G of n is an upper bound or Or more precisely, G of N is an asymptotic upper bound or Is this in clear to all? We will do some examples and I think clear. So let's do some examples. So, so we say let's F of n uh, b say b and c uh, plus two n square plus let's find five n plus six. Okay. Then we say. Of n is in two. This means f of n is three n cube plus two n square minus five n plus six. G of n is just n cube. Is this in clear? Yes, sir, clear. Have you seen uh, this phone rotation before? Have you seen, has any one of you seen uh, um, Seen these notations before? Yes, sir. We have seen these notations before. Where in which course? Sir, in data structures, I guess. And in introduction to artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. So, how much detail did you cover in book? Did you cover how to manipulate these uh, notations and how to use these notations? Um, how to, um, I mean, uh, add and subtract and do other, other things with these notations and things like that. Have you done that? Okay, sorry. So anyway, <clears throat> so over here, I have written that f of n is in O of n cube. Is it possible to write, so this is, this is, this we know it's, it's okay. Is it okay if I write uh, f of n is in O of n power four? Is it correct or incorrect? Yes or no? No, sir. No? How many of you say no? How many of you say yes? Or how many of you say it's in? Yes. Yes, no? Or if I say that f of n is in O of 
n square. Will your answer change or it will remain the same? So it's still no. So it is no for both? Yes for both, no for one, yes for the other, or yes for first, or, or no for the other? No Which for one is both. No for both. Yes for okay. first and no for second. Yes uh, for first and no for second. Okay. And uh, anyone who says yes for both? Okay, anyone who said that um, no for both, uh, can you explain why? Sir, because the in the equation, the highest order is n q, so I don't okay. think we can go about that. Okay, okay, good. And what about uh, who says uh, yes for the first and no for the second? Why did you say that? Yes. Sir, pehle, pehle jo, uh... N four है तो N three जो उसे नीचे तो वो हो सकता है और N two जो नीचे है N three से तो उसके अंदर नहीं आ सकता है okay so the answer is yes for this one and no for this one right sir is it uh, the reason is because it's upper bound that's why exactly so 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 let us go back to our definition we say that uh, and the definition says that we say that a function f of n is in o of g of n okay if positive number c and n sub 0 exist such that such that so so both c0 is positive and n0 is, is positive okay such that for for every n greater than or equal to n0 f of n is at most c times g of n if it is the case, then we say that it is true, right? So if you look at this uh, expression, this function f of n, then we see that this function f of n is three n cubed plus two n square minus five n plus six. So this is a cubic function. So we can find out uh, therefore what values of n, uh, I mean, for each value of n, what would be the value of n, right? So we can plug n equal to zero, then we can plug n equal to one and so on and so forth. As a result, we will uh, receive some value, some number, right? Uh, so if I plot it, I will get a graph, right? Uh, but if I look at the other side here, I have a function which is very similar to the function f of n, uh, but it doesn't have these smaller terms, right? These, so there is a quadratic term here, there's a linear term here, there's a constant term here, but there's no quadratic or linear or constant term here. And even uh, the coefficient of the highest degree term is just one here, and we have three here, right? Uh, but it still doesn't matter. Why it doesn't matter? Because we know that the behavior of this n cube is very similar to the entire function. Because as, so, so remember, I said that this is an asymptotic upper bound. So this asymptotic is important over here. So by asymptotic upper bound means that we are interested in the limit. We are not interested for, for smaller values of n. We are interested when the values of n are actually big, when they tend to be infinite. So whenever we say in mathematics that something tends to be infinite, it means that for really big values of n, right? So if you put really big values of n in function f or g, uh, we know that as n grows, uh, the value, so any quadratic term here or linear term here will have a minor impact on the actual value of f of n, right? And since such values do not exist here, it doesn't matter. So we, we, we can say that we can compensate all of that with some constant here. So let's call that constant C. And that constant could be anything. Since that C has to be, just positive. It could be one, it could be two, it could be three, it could be five, it could be 10, it could be 100, it could be any positive number, right? It could be uh, 65.3, it could be 125.9, and whatever. So it could be any positive number. It doesn't even have to be an integer. So it means that whatever that we have after this cubic form can be compensated by some constant value here, right? And if 
that is possible, it means that whatever that we will have on the left hand side will always be less than or equal to whatever that is on the right hand side. So we can always find that the number C. Therefore, f of n is in is an asymptotic upper bound. And the same thing applies for n power four, because if n q is an upper bound for an n q, then n power four could be an upper bound, n power five could be an upper bound, any value, any polynomial of uh, any polynomial of degree three and higher would be an upper bound for this function. But we cannot say the same thing for n square because no matter how big constant you put in front of n square, it will always be negligible when n tends to be infinite and when you compute this, right? So, so we can, I can show this thing something like this. So whenever we say that something is an upper bound, so suppose this is, uh, this is a function. So if I plot a function f of n, this looks like this, right? And there's another function g of n, and I multiply that function g of n with some constant, uh, then that function looks like this. this is c times g of n. So you can see that this, this is always above this f of n. In this particular case, we can say that this is the point n zero, and we say that for all n greater than or equal to n zero, f of n is less than or equal to c times g. Of n. This is what we mean by asymptotic upper bound. So this will always give you an upper bound. Okay, is this thing clear? Okay, so there are other examples as well uh, involving logs, for example. Um, so suppose. Um, Suppose I have a function f of n, which is just a log of n. And I have a function g of n, which is n times log of n. Then I can write that f of n is in O of n log n. This is, this is correct. Okay. And remember that we have a subscript here too, and we do not have any subscript here, right? And the reason is uh, inside O notation, these bases for the log are not right. Uh, we can we can always change the base of log with a constant multiple. Okay. So when we do calculus. All logs are are in the base uh, base e. While when we do CS, all logs are in base two. Okay, uh, so it doesn't matter. Actually. So whenever we say log, if I don't put a subscript uh, with that log understand that this is log to the base two. When we do uh, computer science, but for everything else for every engineering or physics or any, any other science, when, when they use log, um, and even in mathematics, uh, when we use log, uh, we say that the, the base of that log is natural number E, uh, the Euler's constant. And uh, when we do CS, uh, the ba base is two. And they are interchangeable, right? So, so for, for logs of base E, we usually write them LN, which we call natural log. And when we, we write uh, log to the base two, we just write LG, it means that it is log to the base two. But it's okay, it's just notation. We can interchange this notation and log means log to any base, uh, regardless of how we uh, write it, right? Uh, so it is, not, it is not important that we write base here because that base can be ignored. Right, so we know that uh, if I have, so so we can change the base any any base you like. Uh, do you know how and why? So for this, I I assume that you all know uh, the properties of log, right? Log function. 
For example, if I if I take log of any base okay, of number x and y, then this is log the same base of x plus log of y. Right? It can be generalized, and we say that. Um, so if I have a log to the base two of let's say x1 times x2 times xn, and this is the sum of log, let's say b. Okay. Similarly, if I have a log to the base b of some number x power y, then this is same as y times log to the base b of x. So we can bring, um, okay, and similarly, log of x divided by y to the base b is equal to log x minus log y, given that y is not equal to. Okay. And similarly, for example, if I say that, let's say, I say that I want to find out log base b of a number x, okay? And I say this is equal to y. What does it mean? It means that b power y is equal to, right? Now I can apply um, natural log on both sides. For example, if I apply natural log on both sides, I have b, y, is ln x. Now I can apply this property of log and it will become y times ln b is equal to ln x. And this means y is equal to ln x divided by ln b. But this y is exactly equal to log base b. So it means that it is natural log of x divided by natural log of. So you can always change the base. So it doesn't matter if the base is e or two or three or five or any other base, as long as that is greater than, uh, greater than one, you can always convert the base. I hope that is clear. Okay. Okay, okay let's come back to our asymptotic notations and um, is everything clear so far? Any questions? Any questions? So we talked about big O notation. Okay. Which is f of n is in big O of a function g of n. So let's talk about another notation which we call small O notation. Okay. And just look at what is the difference. So we again have two functions f and g. And both these functions are from set of natural numbers to set of positive real numbers. So we say that f of n is in small o of g of n. So remember, this is small o, not big o. Uh, when I write it all over here, it may not uh, be as clear as, as the other big o, but when we type, it's definitely recognizable that it's small. So we say that f of n is a small uh, is in a small o of g of n if 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 the quotient, which is f of n divided by g of n, if you take the limit of this quotient when n tends to infinite, is, is zero. If the limit is zero, then we say that uh, it is small. Or in, we can we can define it other. In other words, in other words, f of n is in small o of g of n means what does it mean? It means that any real, so for any real number C, which is greater than zero, for any positive real number C, a number N sub zero exists, where F of N is less than, strictly less than, C times G of N for all values of N greater than zero. Okay, do you see the difference between this definition and the bigger previous definition?
So the difference between this definition and the previous definition was when we define the big O, we say that there exists a constant C, which is real number, but in, in positive, and a constant N zero, which is positive. And then f of n is, is, is less than or equal to c times j. So the first difference is, difference is that rather than less than or equal, we have just uh, uh, less than here. So it is strictly less than. This is one difference. And the other difference is that for any real number c, not just one real number c, but every possible real number c which is positive, it must hold. So if it holds for one, it should also hold for 0.5. It must hold for half, it must hold for quarter, it, for, it must hold for one third or one fifth or one tenth, or it must hold for any positive numbers, small or big, it must hold, right? So this is the difference. If it holds, then we say that it's smaller. And uh, if, if you do not want to go into that complexity and, and in details, uh, this limit definition is enough. If you figure out, figure out that, um, that if you have a quotient F and you have a quotient if you have a function f and you have a function g such that the quotient of f, f and g when you take the limit when n tends to uh, in infinite is zero then you know that the function f of n is in is in o of g of n, right uh, there is um, there is an analytical understanding behind this limit and that is um, so you remember that if i if i have a some if i have number a and i have a number b and i say that this number if if i say that this number is equal to zero, what does it mean? It means either A is zero or B is infinite. Right? This is exactly what we say. It, whenever we have a small O notation, it means that function f of n grows much slower than the function g of n. So g of n grows much faster than f of n. Okay, so let us do some example and, uh, and it will be clear. Uh, so for example, if I say f of n is in, so let, let me take the same example, three n squared plus two n, uh, three n cubed plus two n squared, minus six n plus five, for example, maybe not the same. Uh, then I, I can say that this f of n is in small o of n power four. Okay? And this is correct. But if I say that f of f n is in a small o of n cube, this is incorrect. Okay, because when we say in small, small o of n cube, so we know that the equation, the polynomial on the left hand side is again a, a cubic polynomial, then a cubic polynomial is very similar to any cubic polynomial, right? So no, this is not the case. So whenever we have small o, we know that they are they are different. They cannot be from the same class of polynomials. So they have to be different. Okay, they have to be different. So it means that there is no constant, no positive real number such that you apply in front of n cube and it will be bigger than n4. It is impossible. Not just for one constant or two constants or three constants, for every positive constant, it is impossible. Therefore, it is even. Or if you want to take the limit approach, you can you can do that. Since f of n is, is cubic, uh, so which is 3n cubed plus 2n squared uh, minus 6n plus 5, this is f of n, I can divide it by n power 3 and I take the limit where n to infinite and see what, what we get, okay? Uh, we know that this is not equal to zero. This is definitely not equal to zero. In fact, so if you want, we can try. So, so let's divide this three n cube by n cube plus two n squared by n cube minus six n divided by n cube plus pi over n cube. And the limit is for n, So we know that this n cube cancels out and square cancels with this cube. So we have two. Uh, so what we have, what we have left is three plus zero 
minus zero plus zero because anything any constant divided by infinite is so this is equal to three and it's not equal to zero. Therefore, it is not correct. But if you go with the other way, you know that this is zero and therefore. Any question? Okay, so let us define um, the most important thing. And we say the definition for time complexity Okay. We say let t be a function. That is function from set of natural numbers to set of positive real numbers. We define the time complexity class. We define the time complexity class as follows. We say time of t of n. So this is the time complexity class. So let's call it time. Okay. To be a collection. of all languages that are inside of you by O of T of N time. Okay, is this definition clear? Does this make any sense? So, <clears throat> so we define a function, t, a function t. This function t is a time complexity function. And for this time complexity function t, we define a time complexity class, a class of time complexity, which we call time tn. Okay, so we call it time tn. And what do we include in this time TN? So this is a class of languages, a collection of languages. And it contains, so if it is a collection of languages, it means a set. So it is a set of all those languages which are decidable by a Turing machine, which runs in time of T of N. Okay, this T could be anything, it could be of n, this could be n, it could be n squared, it could be n cube, it could be log n, it could be n log n, it could be n power four, it could be any function that we, uh, that we, that we have, right? It could be a polynomial function, it could be a log function, it could be a polylog function, it could be exponential function. So it could be logarithmic function, so it could be any function, right? Any suitable time complexity function. So we would see later on that some functions are time constructible, some functions not time for so so we will we will talk about those things later uh, but this is called time complexity class is this thing clear so in this class we will include in this class we would include all such languages which can be decided by a training machine that runs in time of your okay and based on this we have our first result And this, this theorem says that let t of n be a function. When I say it's a function, definitely the function is, is, is of this form. Okay. Where t of n is greater than or equal to n. Okay. And it's not just this function, we have restriction that it is not just a logarithmic function or sublinear function, it has to be at least linear. So we say that then every t of n time 
multi tape Turing machine has the equivalent of t square of n time okay so if you can if you can uh, decide a language on a multi tape turing machine in time t of n then in order to simulate the same turing machine on a single tape uh, the time will be quadratic it's quadratic in the actual form. For example, if the actual function t of n was n, uh, which is the time required by a multi tape turing machine, then the time required by a single tape turing machine will be n squared. If it was uh, n log n, then it will be n square log n. Okay, n square log square n, and so on. So, so it is just the square of whatever the time. So we are not going to prove this theorem. Um, the proof is is not difficult, uh, but it requires some. Um, I mean, I mean, it is involved, and you need to go into details that how to simulate a multi tape Turing machine on a single tape Turing machine. If you remember our discussion from Turing machines, uh, then you can use that knowledge and and see that. Okay. Any questions? Okay. Now, so far we have been talking about uh, Turing machines, the single tape, multi tape, but. Um, our discussion has been around the deterministic Turing machine, right? Now we have to figure out that what happens if, if the machine is non deterministic. So, what happens to the time complexity of such Turing machines? So, we will talk about those uh, non deterministic Turing machines and non deterministic and time complexity non -deterministic machines uh, after the break. So, so let's uh, go for a break, maybe a 15 minutes break. And when we come back, when we all come back, we will start talking about. Non-deterministic machine. Okay, but before before we go for break, is there any question? No, sir. Okay, in that case, uh, it's it's seven twenty nine. So let's take a break for fifteen minutes. Let's come back at maybe seven forty five. Seven forty four. Okay. See you in fifteen minutes. Okay, any questions? So let's talk about uh, running time for non deterministic. Value. Okay. So we have very similar definition. Uh, so let's see. Can be a non deterministic Turing machine uh, that is side. Running time of n is a function Maximum number of steps that n uses on any branch is on Okay. 
So the definition for the running time of a non-deterministic training machine is really very similar to the running time of a deterministic Turing machine. So what happens in a deterministic Turing machine is, is that we have a machine. So let's say we have a Turing machine M and we have some input X such that the length of this input X is N and it is accepts and it rejects because it's a decider. Then we say that the number of steps made inside the steering machine uh, the, made by this steering machine M is the running time. Now this is for deterministic Turing machine, right? And for non-deterministic Turing machine, we have a very similar thing that we have input X such that the length of input X is, is N. Uh, we, we pass this X to a Turing machine N. So this N for the non-deterministic version, it accepts or rejects. NTM. And so the, the only difference between a deterministic machine and a non deterministic machine is that inside a deterministic machine, there is only one execution. So when the execution starts, when the computation starts, uh, the machine has just one state space. And, and we can predict and we know exactly what will, where the machine will be at each and every point and a machine is only in one state at a time. It cannot be in multiple states. Right? It's a deterministic machine, so either it is in Q1 or Q2 or Q3 or Q4 or any other state, but it will be in just one of the state. But when the machine is non-deterministic, when we have a non-deterministic Turing machine, then we know that there might, might be multiple Turing machines, multiple, uh, multiple branches of computation. And as, as, a, as an analogy of, of non-deterministic Turing machine, I, I said that, that we can imagine that at every step, Turing machine spawns itself from that point onwards and creates an, another machine that runs in that direction, right? independent of other branches. So whenever there is this non-determinism, that is at every step, with the machine uh, may, may, may go into multiple state at, at the same uh, step, then all those branches exist in reality at the same time. So all those branches exist. So if you contrast, so if, if you contrast the two things, so in a deterministic machine, in in a deterministic machine in DTM or deterministic Turing machine, so the machine starts at a single point, then after some steps, it goes to another sta state, then another state, then another state, and so on, till it either accepts or reject, right? It either is accept or reject, okay? And if, and we can count the number of steps in a function f of n. This f of n will be the maximum length of any, maximum length of execution for any input of length n, right? Now, if you contrast it with the NTM, that is the non-determinist security machine, it starts at one single entry point, but at, at any point, the machine can go into multiple states, right? So maybe it, even in the first step, it can go into two states. And from here, it can go to multiple states and multiple states and multiple states and multiple states and so on, right? Since this NTM is also a decider, so both of them are decided. It means that for every input, every possible input that you will throw at these machines, these machines will stop their computation after some finite amount of time, right? They will not wait for it. So it means that there exists one such path here such that it leads to accept or reject. We do not know which path, but there must exist one path. So what we would do, we would say that, okay, all those paths which exist, we will figure out the steps from that point to that point, but we will ignore all those paths and we will only consider the path which leads to accept or reject. Now, it is also possible that there are multiple accept or reject paths, right? A multiple accept paths or multiple reject paths. Reject path. So we say that in, in such cases, we will find out the maximum length of such path. So a path of the maximum length. 
and we will assign that path of maximum length as the FN or the running time of the steering machine. And all such paths which do not need to accept or reject will be ignored, right? So this is the difference between a deterministic machine and a steering machine, uh, in, in a non-deterministic machine. So in deterministic machine, um, there's only one execution, single execution path, while in a non-deterministic steering machine, there are multiple paths, and all those multiple branches are responsible um, for carrying out the computation, forwarding the computation, and some paths may die out after some, some time, and some paths may go into an infinite loop, but overall the machine is, uh, is a decider, so this means that there exists one such path um, which will lead to accept reject type. In fact, if it is a decider, there is no path which will go into an infinite loop, all paths will either die out or they will go to accept or reject. Um, and um, if we can find such a path, then the length of that path is basically the running. Is this thing clear? Is the distinction clear? Now, so when we talked about the running time for deterministic tearing machine, we said that, okay, what happens if you have multiple tape, multi tape tearing machine and, and you try to simulate with, with a single tape, then the time increases uh, as the square, right? So we have a similar theorem uh, uh, for non-deterministic machine as well. And the theorem says that let t of n be a function. Okay. Again, uh, this t of n has to be greater than equal to n. That is, it cannot be sublinear or look at. Then every t of n time non deterministic Tuning machine, not just non deterministic tuning machine, single tape non deterministic tuning machine, equivalent two power o of n time. Deterministic single tape. Okay, so see the difference. If we have multi multi tape tearing machine and that multi tape is is, is a is a deterministic machine, then simulating it with a single tape only increases the time quadratically. But if you have a single tape non deterministic tearing machine. And if you try to convert it into a deterministic tearing machine, then the time uh, grows exponential, right? So from t of n, it goes to two power t of n. Right? So two power O of t of n. So suppose, this is the end of, uh, suppose, there exists a, a non-deterministic Turing machine uh, that decides a language in time, uh, let's say two n plus three, okay, time, where n is the length of the input. Then an equivalent deterministic Turing machine M will decide L in time O of two power O of two N plus three, which is equal to O of right. So, so this is linear time. And this one is exponential time. Okay, is this thing clear? Okay. 
Okay. So again, we are not going to uh, going into the proof of this theorem. The proof is again not uh, difficult. It's a little bit involved, and the outline of the proof is that that if we have a non-deterministic Turing machine, and so for example, uh, if we have a deterministic Turing machine which has the number of states is, is uh, if the set of the states is Q, then in a non-deterministic Turing machine we can have all possible states, which is a power Q, and usually the power sets are in their exponential amount of states compared to the actual set. That's that's that is the connection, right? So we are not going to prove it, but is this thing clear? So it means that it doesn't matter. Um, if we have a single tape tuning machine or multi tape tuning machine or deterministic tuning machine or non deterministic tuning machine, you can always simulate all such kinds of machine with a single tape deterministic tuning machine at an expense of some time uh, deficiency. Right? For example, if you have a single tape, if you have a multi, multi tape or deterministic tuning machine and simulating it on, on a deterministic single tape tuning machine, then the increase in time will be quadratic. And if you have a non-deterministic single tape tuning machine, then simulating such a machine on a deterministic machine uh, will be exponential gain in time, right? So it will take a lot more time than it actually did on uh, not. So, but it doesn't it doesn't mean that you cannot compute what you would compute with non-deterministic machine. You can still compute with uh, whatever that you were able to compute on non-deterministic machine using a deterministic machine, uh, but the time is is lot more than what it used to be. Okay, is this in clear? Any question? If it is clear, then we move on to one of the most important uh, definitions of. Uh, and sir, yes. uh, sir, uh, you said that this one is the NTM. We are saying that its running time, if we uh, compare it to deterministic Turing machine. Uske mein two to exponential, right? So two to the power uh, two to the O n, right? Yes, two power two power O of T n. Yes. Right. So if we have a deterministic Turing machine, if we convert it convert to a to an NTM, so it will be same ye uh, that's an interesting question. Uh, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, the thing is, the answer is both yes and no. Uh, in general, uh, no, it is not going to happen. Uh, that is, if you have a DTM that runs in time t of n, then NTM will will it run in log of uh, time t of n? No, it's not guaranteed. No guarantee. No guarantee. But if you have an NTM that runs in time t of n then your DTM will run, run in time O of T of N, for sure. Okay, why? Because over here, we do not have a, we do not have, a, I mean, the reason is, um, sometimes it is possible to have a deterministic Turing machine which runs in time T of N, and very with, with a very small gain, uh, with very small uh, efficiency, we can have a non-deterministic machine and it will run similarly faster or, or similarly slow. Uh, so there is no guarantee that will always speed up uh, uh, using non, non-determinism may speed up, but it is not guaranteed. But if you have a non-deterministic machine that runs in some specific time, then for sure, uh, if you try to convert it into a deterministic machine, then the running time will increase. Now, when I say the running time will increase, again, this is in, in terms of asymptotic uh, measurement, right? Uh, so so how, how it is uh, the case? So look at this one. For example, if I say that f of n is, let's say, uh, 2n squared plus 3n minus 1. Right? Then I know that f of n is in O of n square. f of n is also in O of n cube. f of n is also in O of 2n, 2 power. So all these are correct because all of them are upper bound. All of them are upper bound. 
So in when when we say that whenever we have a non-deterministic Turing machine which runs in a time t of uh, t of n, then we will have a DTM which will run in this particular time. This does this could be any function. We do not know what is that, right? So we we would have we would have an exponential uh, slowdown. Okay, but will we have an exponential uh, speed up? No guarantee. There's no there's no possibility that we can guarantee something. In some problems, yes. But, but it can but be the case, sir. It can, but in general, no. Okay. Okay. In general, no. Any other question? So, so we now we have one of the most, uh, I think, important definition of uh, this part of the course, uh, which is the definition for the class. Thing. Maybe you have heard about this class. So let's formally define. So we say that the P is a class of languages okay, that are decidable in polynomial on a deterministic. Single take okay. In other words, we can define it more practically. We say that P is a class which is union of time of n power k a. a is just a this is the definition of the class. This is one of the most uh, um, important definition of uh, complexity theory. So the class B is called the class of languages. And when we talk about languages, of course, we can talk about problems. Right? So they are sometimes interchangeable. So P is a class of decision problems or languages that are decidable in polynomial time on a deterministic single tape Turing machine. Okay, so for all those languages, for example, for all those languages for which you can construct a Turing machine which runs in time O of one, okay or O of n, or O of n square, or O of n cube, or O of n power four. So we have O of one, O of n, O of n square, O of n cube. Maybe we can, we should not talk about. And so on. And everything in between all of those things, so if, so there might be infinitely many languages which can be decided by a Turing machine which runs in O of n time. Uh, there might be infinitely many uh, languages which can be decided by Turing machines in time of n squared and so on and so forth. Uh, if we collect all those languages and put all of them in, in a set, then we say that set is the set P or class P. Okay, so class P contains all problems or polynomials, uh, all problems or languages, which can be decided by a single tape taking machine, which is deterministic in polynomial. So this is called polynomial. Or the other words, we say that P is the class all problems that can be computed polynomial time on a single tape deterministic okay so all those problems all those languages are in class p so this p is for polynomial So most of the time, if a language L is in this class P, 
it means that l is is, is an easy problem So I have put easy in inverted, uh, I mean, in quotations, uh, because easy doesn't mean easy. I mean, from from a lay term, uh, I mean, normal English meaning, it means that the running time for deciding that language is polynomial. A polynomial could be of n, o of n squared, o of n cube, o of n power four, and so on, but it, it is not or anything more than polynomial. Is this thing clear? So what okay. exactly do you mean by polynomial time? Polynomial time. Okay, anyone, can anyone answer this question? Yes, can anyone answer this question? What is, what is meant by polynomial time? Polynomial time means that a function p of n that measures, counts the number of steps as running time is a polynomial function. I would write some functions here and just tell me which one are polynomial. Okay, so I have seven functions here. So can you tell me which functions are polynomial and which functions are not polynomial? What about T1? Is it polynomial? Yes, T1 is polynomial. What about T2? Polynomial. Yes. What about T3? Polynomial. What about T4? Polynomial. That's the question. It is not polynomial. What about T5? Yes, what about T5? Is it polynomial or not polynomial? Not polynomial. Not polynomial. Yes, it is not polynomial. What about T6? Not polynomial. Not polynomial. So what is a polynomial? So we say that P of N is a polynomial in N if it can be written as a zero X power N plus a one X power N minus one plus a N such that a zero is not equal to zero. Okay, so we say that P of N is a polynomial in, in N with degree N, okay? So all of these three things, I mean, in, among these six functions, uh, one, two, three are polynomials, four, five, six are not polynomials. One may argue that we have a log here, then why do we still call it a polynomial? We, can, we call it polynomial because I can rewrite it as uh, O of N squared, right? And N squared is polynomial. 
But for any of the functions uh, after 3T3, three, 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 for T4, T5, T6, I cannot write it, I cannot write it as O of n power k for any k greater than equal to. It is impossible. No matter how big the k is, k could be 5, 10, 100, 200, 500, I cannot write them. Therefore, they are not, they cannot be considered as polynomial, right? So we cannot do this thing for T5, we cannot do it for T5, T6, and so on. But for the first three, we can do it. So if the running time of any Turing machine can be captured or measured in a polynomial function, then we say it's a polynomial. In the, in, in the corresponding Turing machine, the polynomial time Turing machine. Okay, and if it cannot be measured or counted, or um, I mean, yeah, if it cannot be measured or counted in a function which is polynomial, so we don't say it. Right? We, we don't. If we even don't say non-polynomial, that's that doesn't exist. Such word does not exist, uh, at least uh, in this context. So we either have polynomial or something that is not polynomial. Okay. So if the running time can be measured or expressed by a polynomial, then we say it's polynomial time. If it cannot be measured or expressed in polynomial, then it's okay, it's not polynomial. Okay, is this thing clear? So for all Turing machines, for all problems, such that those problems can be decided by a Turing machine, such that their running time is measured or expressed or counted by a polynomial are included in the class. They could be very simple problems. They could be very difficult problems. They could be a problem which we know. They could, that could be a problem which we do not. But if there exists a Turing machine which measures the time or such that the time of that Turing machine can be expressed as a polynomial, then we say that it's a polynomial. Provided the Turing machine is a single tape Turing machine and it is a deterministic Turing machine. So we don't talk about multi tape Turing machines right now or non deterministic Turing machines. So we will talk about those things later, right? For the time being, only deterministic Turing machines with which are single, which are single. This is thing clear now. Does that answer your question? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, I have two more points and uh, let me make those points and then we can uh, talk about it. Uh, so point number one, which is a claim, I say that this P, this class P is invariant for all models of computation. Okay? That are polynomially equivalent to a deterministic single tape Turing machine. So this is a technical thing to talk about. I, I say my claim is that P is invariant okay for all models of computation okay that are polynomially equivalent to the deterministic Single tape thing. Okay. It means that P is invariant. It doesn't matter. So this means that, so this means that in from the definition of class P, you can convert or you can replace the single tape deterministic Turing machine with any model of computation which is equivalent, polynomially equivalent to this model. Okay. Which models are polynomially equivalent to deterministic single tape Turing machines? Deterministic multi tape Turing machines are equivalent to single tape deterministic Turing machines. Why? Because the time difference or, or the time speed up or gain that you uh, uh, get or, or the speed slowdown that you receive going from multi tape to single tape is polynomial. So it's, it's a quadratic. So we had we, the first theorem uh, that we considered today was that if there is a Turing machine, M, which is a multi-tape Turing machine, a deterministic Turing machine, which takes time T of N to compute something, then the inequivalent single tape Turing machine will take time T square of N, right? So square is a, is a polynomial transformation, right? So if you have a T of N, you multiply T of N with itself, you get the square. 
Now, squaring is a polynomial operation, so it is equivalent. So you can replace the deterministic single tape tuning machine with deterministic multi tape tuning, and it will still remain the same. But you cannot replace it with determinist, uh, non deterministic single tape tuning machine. Why? Because the equivalence of non deterministic machine and deterministic machine is not polynomial. Right? Uh, so the speed up or uh, speed down, or slowing down is, 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 is exponential. It's not polynomial. So you cannot replace this deterministic with non deterministic. And for that matter, every model of computation that we know now, or maybe it will come tomorrow, such that it is equivalent, polynomially equivalent to deterministic single tape tuning machine, we can replace it. Okay? So one such model could be a program written in Java or C++ okay, that runs on one processor and it does not use randomization, then that model of computation is also equivalent here. So you can replace it with, with this deterministic signal because they are polynomially equivalent to single tape deterministic equations. Okay, but if you have, if you write a program in Java or C++ or Python or any programming language which uses randomization, then you cannot replace it, right? Because a randomized program is not, uh, it, it, it is not polynomially equivalent to deterministic variables. Okay, is this thing clear? So this was the claim number one. Okay, and this this is a technical claim. There is there is a side note here, and we say that uh, when whatever that is in class P, it actually or roughly corresponds to the class of problems. Uh, that are realistically solvable on, right? So we can solve those problems on, on computer in realistic time. Uh, anything that is not in P is usually very difficult to compute. And we will see a lot of problems which are not in P, right? So class P looks like to be infinitely big and it is infinitely big. There are infinitely many languages and problems which are in class P. Uh, but still, there are problems which are outside this class P. So again, if we if we draw this uh, set notation or uh, Venn diagram, so if it is class P, and there are infinitely many languages inside, but definitely there are things which are outside this class P. And whatever that is in this in this class P can be realistically solved by a computer, and whatever that is not in this class P can still be solved on a computer, but it takes a lot of and sometimes. Uh, we cannot solve those problems uh, of any significant size. If they are smaller uh, toy examples, fine, but we cannot uh, in, in general. Uh, so, so what are those problems? So I, I give you some examples. For example, uh, timetabling is one such problem which is outside this. So it is almost impossible to come up with a perfect timetable uh, if you have sufficiently large number of constraints, for example, uh, creating a timetable for every student and faculty and, uh, and the resources which are available at IBA is realistically impossible. I mean, to create a perfect timetable is impossible. It is impossible to satisfy everyone's cons constraints. Uh, so this, that timetable will be constrained by the number of available classrooms at the time number of available other resources. For example, some classes require special hardware uh, and, and not every classroom has those specific hardware. So we have constraints. Then there are constraints that no two students, uh, I mean, no student can be in two classes at the same time. Uh, no faculty can teach multiple classes at the same time. Um, and, and there are many other constraints, right? So, so it is impossible to construct a perfect timetable which satisfies each and every constraint uh, imposed by the faculty or staff or students in the available resources in any given sufficiently uh, larger or that it is impossible. And why it is impossible? Because the time it will take to come up with a perfect solution uh, will be huge. So if it is a small problem containing, let's say five to 10 or 50 students, and a couple of faculty members and let's say 15 or 20 classrooms and an unlimited supply of resources of, of boards and PowerPoint uh, projectors and other things, then possibly we can do that. Uh, but if the number of students increases, if the number of faculty increases, number of schools and programs increases, interdependency of uh, courses increases, 
then this is really tough problem, right? And it is one of the practical problems that everyone uh, has to, uh, everyone faces in any organization, and there is no solution. The next time when you are unhappy with your schedule, uh, it's it's not that somebody has malicious intent. It's because it is really hard problem. It, it cannot be solved, regardless how efficient computers you have. It is impossible to solve. So what what we uh, end up with is an approximation, is an approximate solution, uh, which caters to constraints of most people and most resources, uh, but definitely it is not perfect. Some people will not have it. Some students and some faculty will never do it because this is exactly what it is. Anyway, so we will end the class here and we will talk about the non-deterministic version of this class B in uh, which we get from the non-deterministic Turing machine. So for example, if we replace, um, where is that definition? So for example, if we replace this deterministic uh, Turing machine, no, not here. Yeah, in this class P, if we replace the deterministic single tape Turing machine with non-deterministic single tape Turing machine, and what are the changes that we have to make to this definition? Then what do we get as a class? And whatever class that we will get, what is the relationship of that class with this class P? Um, and, and we will see all those relationships in, in, in next week. So with that, I will um, end this class. If you have any like, any questions, then let me know. Otherwise, uh, we will end. Any questions? Okay, in that case, thank you very much. Uh, I will see you again on Tuesday. And I think I already have announced. So we will have a quiz on Tuesday. I will announce it on LMS as well. Uh, we have a very simple quiz on. Okay, sir, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you, you very much. Take care.